evening, everybody, and welcome to the Batista Forum. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Anna Ford Smith. I'm the Associate Director of CERLAC, the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean at York University. And this is our second forum for this academic year in the Michael Batista series. And we're so glad that you're able to be here with us. The Michael Batista Lecture was established by the friends and family of Michael Batista and the Royal Bank of Canada to recognize his love of learning, his Guyanese Caribbean roots, and his unqualified drive. We are grateful also to the LAPS Event Fund for their generous contribution to this series. Please allow me to introduce Colin Zia, who is a graduate student in the Faculty of Political Science here at York and whose work focuses on settler states and indigeneity. Colin is one of the researchers who, along with Jelisa Ricketts, works on our new IARIC initiative, a special initiative focused on building Black, Indigenous and Caribbean student community and scholarship Colin is going to offer the land acknowledgement for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. Good, e good evening, everyone. I'm Colin. So before today's discussion can begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that I, myself, and many others are currently situated in Toronto. This area has been traditionally cared for by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. Today, it's home to many other First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. And I want to acknowledge that the current treaty holders are the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement that many of us are implicated in and has yet to be honored. Since today is about the unthinkable, my hope is to prompt everyone to confront some of the unthinkable violences occurring on this land. And I think having virtual spaces like this to learn in is also an opportunity to reflect on some of the strained and difficult relationships we have with the land and its indigenous caretakers. And whenever I attend events centered on the Black diaspora, I'm reminded that Black radical traditions itself stem from a loss of indigenous land. And in this common pain, I think there's also space to consider Black Indigenous relationalities and the many ways that we need to care for Indigenous peoples as our kin in co-resistance. And with that said, I'll pass it back to Honor. Thank you. Thanks very much, Colleen. Um, I just want to say a word about the IARIC initiative, which Colleen works on along with um, Jalisa Ricketts. It was inaugurated in the fall as a result of the struggles of Black students here at York University. And, and um, since its beginning, it has initiated something called the Black Table Initiative, a naming inspired by Professor David Trotman, a long-standing fellow here at CERLAC, who gave a lecture last year on Black histories at York and Black struggles at York. The Black Table Initiatives uh, initiative kicked off in February with a reasoning entitled The Art of Black Research C Creation, which featured the work of Camille Turner and Natalie Wood, two prominent artists here in Toronto. The next Black Table is scheduled for March the 15th, so please save the date. It will focus on Black radical thought and will bring together scholars and students in a panel on the topic. It is Black History Month, and there are many things to think about in this strange COVID February in regard to that theme. So we thought it would be appropriate to organize a panel inspired by the work of the late Haitian historian, Michel Rolf Troyot, whose work, Silencing the Past, reflects deeply on how power produces history and memory 
and how it enables our future. We thought we could best do that by inviting artist scholars from the region to imagine and reflect on emancipatory horizons through the work of Trollo and through the ideas behind his, his work. I want to hand over to Celia Romulus, who's the chair of tonight's panel, to explain a bit more about what the panel will comprise. Celia is one of our newest fellows at um, CERLAC. She joined Glendon's Department of International Studies as a professor in July, and she completed her PhD in the Department of Political Science at Queen's University, where her research focused on the normalization of gendered state repression under the Duvalier dictatorship and how these systematized forms of violence have shaped movements of people out of Haiti and the notion of citizen citizenship as experienced by multiple generations of migrants. I'm going to turn it over to Celia now, who will steer us through tonight as chair. Thanks so much, Celia, for coming and thanks to all our panelists. Well, thank you for inviting me to share this panel. I'm very excited. Um, so yes, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, I would say, housekeeping and the logistics of our panel. Um, I'll have the privilege of introducing each panelist and also to guide you or facilitate the Q&A. Um, but before I do that, maybe I will try to contextualize or provide you with contextual information regarding our conversation. Um, so yes, um, Michel Rolf Trouillot's work is the inspiration for our conversation tonight. So I think it's also important for us to keep in mind that before or in parallel of being a, a scholar, Michel Rolf Trouillot was also um, a songwriter, uh, was also a historian and an activist um, involved in political pro protests against the Duvalier dictatorship um, and against the American government's treatment uh, of undocumented Haitian immigrants. I say that because I think that uh, it's interesting to keep in mind that um, he produced like scholarship with other types of work uh, in communities um, that mobilized historical transmission, but also art um, in order to mobilize, politicize, alter the course of politics, um, and more importantly, create and dream uh, the unthinkable. So I think it's um, a good way to maybe allow us to sit with important questions um, and ask ourselves how art can allow us to unsilence or unearth uh, marginalized narratives or narratives of resistance to injustices, also to um, basically document um, stories and experiences and finally, uh, finally allow us to, to dream about different futures and societies. So that being said, um, I will uh, introduce our first panelist. Um, and thank you again for joining us from a different time zone and to speak with us, although it's super late where you are. So I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Roshini Kampadu, who's a media artist, photographer, and scholar. Roshini creates uh, artworks that interpret and reimagine experiences of the particular and everyday relating to historical legacies and memories by Caribbean persons and its diaspora. Um, she evokes women's perspectives through photographs, fictional writings, recordings, music, interactivity, and networked environments. Roshini's current research and artistic practice explores audiovisual methodologies of Black, Indigenous and persons of colors in relation to Caribbean extraction, sustainability, and ecological activism. Thank you again for being with us and take it away. Thank you, Celia. And thanks to Anna for inviting me and, and Camilla um, for introducing me and, and meeting for the first this time. I'm really excited um, to join um, my other panelists as well and to listen to them. So I'm going to just uh, share the screen um, and I'm going to um, talk through a project that I've been working on um, that I started in 2019. Um, 
and I'll start with that. So I hope everybody can see that. Um, and I'm just really going to talk through, let me just go here, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I'll do some reading as well. Um, like Gold Dust, which is the name of the project, is inspired by, uh, by the opportunity and a return visit to Guyana and being a guest of the First Nations in Wakapoa, Guyana. Additionally, meeting Latina activists, Amelia uh, Ortez, uh, Tijana poet, activist, um, Mexe, Marcus Cervantes, and the late uh, Maria Ibarra. Um, and this was uh, in San Antonio in Texas. So it's this combination of being in Texas and, and going to get and having the opportunity to travel to Guyana. And my interest as an artist and scholar is to research, write and create a practice that contributes to transforming and thinking through more progressive and sustainable ways, as Celia has mentioned, of contributing to cultural imagination in response to our planetary crisis, ecological, social and political. I uh, don't know why this is happening. Oh, sorry. Just move on. Um, but I wanted to start with TJ Demos's quote, and I, this has often helped me to focus on my approach and to think about why I'm creating work and how I think about my responsibility as an artist and researcher. And I think that's been underlying my practice, um, uh, you know, from the beginning in terms of how the perspective and the, the way in which I think about that, um, that inaction, if you like, of making work. So uh, the proposition that T.J. Dumas um, suggests to us is to think about a visuality with political legibility, with decolonial and anti-capitalist values, with focus on the structural causes and the justice-based solutions. And I think for me, that's one of the things that really underpins what I'm trying to do, have been trying to do. So virtual exiles um, is an image I'm, I'm showing you here, is to evoke the position of the researcher and you can read on the, on the um, blackboard where I've worked with a quote um, that talks about this idea of go digging in the archives and thinking about this, uh, the way in which history is, is, uh, displaces us, if you like. Where there is, um, and I'm, I think about the significance of our positions as a researcher and artist, where so many of us have deep and intimate and complex and yet at times remote knowledge of elsewhere, other countries or indigenous cultures through a diasporic background, memories or deep familial histories. As Amy Stillman notes, we might reconstruct knowledge systems with an insistence on living as multitudinous layers, languages or experiential inheritance from the past. In this sense, as a researcher and scholar and artist, experiential inheritance offers a sentiment of how we might think about the archives as those with embodied histories of slavery, indentureship, or indigenous backgrounds. We can contribute something additional, enriching, expansive, in relation to colonial and post-colonial lands, spaces, people, action. Um, just to say a little bit about the artwork and the piece that I'm, I made in 2019, it was mobilized as a response to the state Guyana finds itself in as it lurches towards becoming one of the largest planetary offshore sites of oil and gas mining spaces, a petrochemical uh, state. And I just wanted to, to share with you some of the recent announcements made about this expansion, if you like, and this, this forming of the petrochemical state. Guyana government it was at COP26 in 2021, where it said, stated, the politicians stated that Guyana will reduce carbon emissions by 70% in 2013. 2030, sorry, February 2022, the oil revenues are, um, have tripled in 2022 to almost US, uh, 1 billion US dollars. And for example, in January 2022, um, we have three Guyanese women who have filed a case against Guyana's Environmental Protection Agency to put a stop to flaring of gas offshore by ExxonMobil. 
We've got Seneca Henry, Adriska Thorrington, and Shalina Nagir, um, and supported by Malin Janki. And it's this last announcement and activism that women uh, have mobilized that I am interested in as someone who wants to give voice to women's experiences, narratives, and actions. Like Gold Dust was the first iteration of a long-term artwork that will morph from, from when I first installed it in 2019, particularly in light of the pandemic and urgency. This was based on a residency at Art Pace in San Antonio. Um, so just to, uh, to talk, as the title implies, like gold dust implies a visceral sense of our relationship to key metals and earth resources used for the development and use uh, and used to make sorry I've lost my place now, used for the development and used to make us, particularly the West, modern societies. Gold dust gives us a sense of the preciousness and commodity financial value that we give to gold as a precious mineral. And this is a map of Guyana where the oil is being uh, ex uh, extracted. Um, I'd like to talk more, I, here I attribute gold dust to the presentist and future magical qualities of Guyanese women and their knowledge as survivors, as warriors, as keepers of forests and terrains of peoples, people and things in the landscape. The environmental um, lawyer, as Melinda, Melinda Jankies uh, mentioned, the environmental lawyer from the Justice Institute in Guyana who is seeking legal recourse has explained, the current agreement with the Guyana government will put Guyana into debt in the, in, to the oil companies and needless to say poses environmental uh, risks uh, and political risks. So based on a return visit to Guyana in 2019, as a daughter of Guyanese parents of the Windrush generation and someone who lived in Guyana during my teenage years, I was very interested in um, thinking most importantly about the First Nations of Guyana, Guyana in, Guyanese indigenous communities, like most nations elsewhere, have a torturous and brutal history of an injustice, reservation living, land displacement and systemic persecution and genocide through colonial history, coming into the firing line with this expansion of Guyana as a petrol, petro state. The work then seeks to embed legacies of commodification through slavery and capitalism and the activism to counter it. My response to my memories of and witnessing in the co contemporary landscape was to do with uh, exposing the slow violence of colonialism and its relationship to its practice of environmental extractivism. And I'm very interested in this notion of slow violence and its connection to colonialism. The artwork needed to be about women's experiences of this, counter-narratives to the robust masculine voice and vision of extraction of resources, imagining a world that contributes to activism, voicing the cumulative violence to women's bodies, violence to landscapes, oceans, in other words, continued ecological devastation. And you can see some more of these images of the images I've taken here. Like gold dust, I created a silent video entitled A Cautionary Statement as part of the installation. And I'll just play a short extract here so you can get a sense of it. Uh, remember it's silent. And it's really to give a, the, the cautionary statement is an interesting title that is a technical term that's used in prospecting um, and associated with approximate guesstimates of wealth, if you like, or guesstimates of wealth. I'll just play that for you now.
And these are just some of the um, some of the kind of the research the research material that I, I worked with. In this sense, light gold dust offers us the symbolic visualizations of white economics and its connections to the notion of extraction of resources, indigenous dispossession through a layering of aesthetics of rupture and fragmentation. And here you can see how oil starts to work into the narrative of the nation in a way and the impact of it, of course, here. So these are some of the photographs I created and montaged together and worked with. Two women figures are presenced in the photographs. They correlate, it correlates with the audio monologue in the gallery space. I envisioned them in the photographs as actors and activists, as confident women in defiant poses, montaged into a Texan landscape with residues of the afterlife of slavery and colonialism. I was interested in the performative act of defiance, confidence, confrontation a willing embodied enunciation as an act of insistence of presence that winter suggests in her phrase um, a hybrid auto instituting language languaging storytelling species to remind us of the transformative powers of poetic knowledges as people and women who are not merely biological beings but inscript ourselves into being and had claimed that we were never human and the need to uh, and the need to fundamentally take into account the way in which we narrate ourselves. And that's become quite an important kind of moment for us to, for me to think about how that kind of presenting uh, uh, might take place. So in that sense, I also worked with the audio, audio script um, and you'll see an extract here from it, but it, it's narrating in a very particular way um, and I'm thinking about activists who, um, I'll just stay on this, activists who are, have informed and influenced me. And I'm thinking about, you know, people like Mech Step or Amalia Ortiz, um, or people in Guyana, such as uh, those from Red Thread, Karen D'Souza and I, Rest in Power, uh, or Alisa Trotz, um, who's in Canada. So women evoked as agents of environmental and socio-political change through the dialogue uh, as fictional characters within which Rosa names uh, Wangari Mathai. And what's interesting about that is to think through this idea of Ma uh, Wangari Mathai's writing in particular, her autobiographical sense of where she thinks through uh, a kind of an emplaced rhetoric. Um, and that was something I was trying to capture in the script and the, the piece that you hear uh, with, with sound and music. So I'm interested in imagining futurescapes that put forward the idea of a more sustainable, more than human life experience. A possibility of a future, particularly in this moment, is not only acknowledging the writings of more pessimistic nihilism, apocalyptic and dystopian images, but also to consider possibilities, glimpses from the space of which the imagination escapes and takes flight. The poem as part of the installation um, by Sarah Russell, uh, Little Crow Russell, I used in the gallery space with her permission, offers a sharply focused commentary of elements involving protests through performance. Um, a historical narrative and beneath the surface of the earth are lurking the possibility of revolution once more. Other planets association with other worlds in which this planet was not for us or um, technological prosthetics and extensions to the human body are all proposed as new knowledge. I infer in this project, like gold dust, an alchemy of and by women with sounds, readings and visuals as a magical process combining transformation and creation, um, imagining and counterbalancing the systemic violence uh, towards black bodies. Um, and to, to think a little bit about activism on this planet in this space and place, 
um, here and now is also a, a, with, with another possibility. Um, the work by the First Nations that I encountered in Texas, for example, continued to remind us of that, that idea of protest movements and poetic spaces. So earth elements containing memories such as trees, their roots, dust, soil, river, water, and wake are posed as alternative evocations. Um, as a cultural activist, I'm concerned with transformational cultural work that proposes questions and comments. It is this evocation of an inextricable link I gesture towards, a fictional and imagined space and a link that contains possibilities that also embeds the historical stuff of legacies and nightmares. Slavery followed by indentureship, the violence towards and displacement acts of First Nation peoples by settler colonies, inhuman acts, white privilege and supremacy. The work gestures towards how we might constitute our black bodies as sovereign, autonomous women. How does this kind of thinking and being make a step change in our relationship to the materiality of the landscape and terrain, and terrain for a more recognizable futurescape. So I'll end it there. Thank you very much for listening and I hope uh, to join in the conversation later. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much for presenting your work um, um, for a rich presentation. So I will, before I um, introduce our second uh, panelist, I'm just gonna remind uh, participants that you can start, um, I would say posting reactions or questions in the Q and A and that we will address them later, but feel free to, to start reacting. Um, now I will introduce our second panelist. So Courtney Desiree Morris, who's a visual and conceptual artist and an assistant professor of gender and women's studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she teaches courses on critical race theory, feminist theory, black social movements in the Americas, women's social movements in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as race and environmental politics in the African diaspora. She is a social anthropologist and is currently completing a book entitled To Defend the Sunrise, Black Women's Activism and the Geography of Race in Nicaragua, which examines how black women activists have resisted historical and contemporary patterns, patterns of racialized state violence, economic exclusion, territorial dispossession, and political repression from the 19th century to the present. Courtney, thank you for being here with us today. We're listening to you. Thank you, Celia, for the introduction um, and to the event organizers for inviting me to be here. Um, it's a real pleasure to be in the company of these scholars and artists whose work I have great respect and admiration for. So thank you for having me. Um, and Roshini, I'm just thank you for that really rich and elegant talk. There's so many points of resonance between um, some of the more recent work that I've been doing. So I really look forward to, I'm not gonna talk about that work in this talk, but um, I would love to just dig more into the things that you're doing. Um, and also wanted to take a moment to just elevate the name of Maria Ibarra, who I had the opportunity to meet when I lived in Austin and who I knew um, not, uh, not very well, but was very familiar with her work as a cultural activist in San Antonio, so loose for her spirit. Um, but I wanna begin today by sort of thinking about, I've, you know, as Celia was saying, I've been working for many years on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua and have recently finished a book um, that's now in production, hooray, through Rutgers University Press. Um, and I, I, it's been an interesting experience because I think I've thought a, a lot about Nicaragua as a scholar. And it's only within the last couple of years that I've really begun to kind of think more about Nicaragua through my practice as a visual um, and performance artist. So this invitation to be a part of this conversation felt like an invitation to really deepen that kind of um, aesthetic inquiry into the nature of my work in Nicaragua. And so that's what I'll be talking about today. And so the presentation that um, I wanna share with you is entitled Impossible Coast. And let me just share my screen real quick. Okay, excellent. So Bluefield Nicaragua is a place that exists somewhere between Latin America and the Caribbean. 
The history of this impossible place remains a, ve a vexed site of struggle in larger debates on the project of settler colonial mestizo nationalism. This project of monoracial nationalism, which has recently devolved into a systematic and brutal campaign of authoritarian democracy, a process that I explore more deeply in my forthcoming book to defend this sunrise black women's activism and the authoritarian turn in Nicaragua, has historically faltered when it has encountered the multiracial, heterogeneous black and indigenous peoples of the Caribbean coast, who have been largely relegated to the margins of the apocryphal romantic narratives of Nicaraguan nation building that the country tells itself about itself. In many ways, Bluefields and the coast writ large remains an illegible and impossible geography in the mestizo racial imagination. I've worked on the coast since 2004, studying the racial geography of Nicaragua and Black women's activism in the struggle for land rights and against authoritarian state violence. When I began my research, I did what most scholars typically do. I turned to the archive. Yet looking for Black women in the archive proved to be a constant exercise in disappointment and failure. There were and remain few traces of Black women in these official archives. When they do appear, they are often dismissed as marginal side players, footnotes in the stories of the men who really make history, or are so distorted as to be rendered unrecognizable. In many ways, this historical disappearing of Black women as key actors in the social and political life of the region reflects contemporary patterns of erasure and misrepresentation that mark Black women as impossible subjects who, quote, as Cynthia Hartman says, fall outside of the order of representation altogether, end quote. They appear in historical photos as nameless figures, the Creole bells serving pastries during local elections, recent Moravian converts performing Christian piety for the photographer, a woman in white placed carefully among the flora and fauna, a regal and fair-skinned beauty queen surrounded by the symbols and regalia of the UNIA, a mosquito girl staring into the camera. And I want to also mention that there is a really very incredible um, kind of you know, young scholar named Melanie White who's been doing some really interesting and I think very important work on the subject of colonial photography and kind of thinking about visual practices of kind of taming and domesticating the quote unquote native subject um, through these sort of acts of visual representation. And I've been really inspired by the work that she's doing. But in these visual representations, Black women are rendered, quote, neither subject or object, but a mute silence thing, like an impossible metaphor or a beach whale or a form yet to be named, end quote. In my research, as I struggled to locate Black women in the archive, I encountered the work of June Beer. Beer is widely considered the most renowned artist of the Caribbean coast and the first Black woman to establish herself in the larger Nicaraguan art world. Born in 1935 to a well-to-do Creole family in Bluefields, Beer would defy the expectations of her community to choose marriage, family, and domesticity, and instead become an artist, a radical, and a dedicated supporter of the Sandinista Revolution. She traveled to Los Angeles in the 1950s, where she worked as an art model for a time, and apparently she modeled for um, the well-known African-American actress Ruby Dee. Um, who gifted her her first set of paintbrushes, uh, with which she then began to um, paint nude self-portraits of herself. Beer returned to Nicaragua in the late 1960s, moving between Bluefields and Managua to pursue her craft as an artist. A self-taught painter, she developed her own style of painting that reflected the landscapes, daily activities, cultural traditions, and racial diversity of the peoples of the Caribbean coast. This work reflected her intense interest in capturing the daily lives of costeños, particularly Black people, as well as her own emergent feminist consciousness. Much of her work featured portraits of Black women represented in their roles as mothers, workers, and revolutionaries. One portrait features a Black woman with a small natural dressed in army fatigues, her right fist raised defiantly in the air. Another offers a rendering of the Nicaraguan revolutionary hero Augusto Sandino as a Black man. If there was little attention paid to the participation of Afro-Nicaraguan women in the revolutionary project, Beer painted them and herself into that history, carving out a space for Black women's radical self-making. And in a lot of ways, you know, for me, when I encountered her, you know, June's work, I remember just being really struck by how, you know, the sort of aesthetics of her, of her practice also were, you know, reflective of a kind of larger set of political commitments and the ways that she was, you know, centrally preoccupied with thinking about Blackness in kind of spatial and geographical terms and really thinking about the place of Blackness 
within the landscapes of the Caribbean coast, but also within the kind of larger project of Nicaraguan nation building um, and discourses of um, Nicaraguan nationalism. While there's been a tendency among Nicaraguan art historians and cultural critics to read Beer's work in a largely folkloric manner, and this is something that, this is a fact that I feel like has remained the case even as her work has finally begun to receive some very long overdue recognition as demonstrated by a flurry of recent solo exhibitions um, in the past few years and the celebration of her work in the 2016 Nicaraguan Art Biennial. I want to suggest that part of the enduring significance of Beer's body of work is how it counters the disappearance of Black women in the archive through the construction of a visual counter archive that privileges intimate space, the body, and desire as sites of Black femme freedom and possibility. And there's something that, you know, I, I was really, I really resonated with Roshini's sort of um, analysis about thinking about the ways that Black women activists and cultural workers are also engaged and also have sort of valuable and important forms of knowledge that they hold um, that are kind of a central part of the work that they're doing. And I think that there was a similar kind of sensibility at work um, in Beer's creative practice. What's always been most striking to me in looking at June's paintings is how she visually narrates Black female desire in its many forms. It's from June that I learned how art might function as a prefigurative practice of Black friend freedom and futurity. In her germinal work against purity, living ethically in compromised times, Alexis Shotwell defines prefiguration as a practice of, quote, living in the present, a world we want to create, and crafting that world through our living, end quote. It's a practice of impossible desire, an attempt to call a new world into being through embodied practices of erotic autonomy and self-fashioning that refuses the normative terms of citizenship and national belonging. Beer's work, which centers Black women dancing, holding their mixed-faced children in their laps, embedded in nature, hanging out with their friends, um, or portraits where the subject stares back at the, view, at the viewer with an unflinching gaze, really speak to all the kind of mundane and quotidian ways that Black women, that she identified Black women attempting to enact their desires for an otherwise, for an elsewhere, um, in ways that might not have been readily available to them um, in their present moment. And so I've been coming back to, you know, when I was writing my dissertation and writing my book, I thought a lot about June as a kind of political figure. And I talk a lot about her in my work in that way. But, you know, recently I've been thinking a lot about how to be in conversation with June as an artist now that I've kind of really begun to develop my own creative practice. And while the roots of my creative practice as a visual, conceptual, and, and performance artist are multiple, one root most certainly lies in Nicaragua and my ongoing encounters and engagements with the work of June Beer. In 2009, um, and these are some more, you can see some more of her self portrait of these portraits here, these beautiful portraits that she um, uh, completed about of Black women, Black women and girls that I love um, so much. And so, you know, in 2009, as I was conducting a year of field work in Bluefield, I began to take a series of self-portrait photographs, um, kind of documentary uh, photographs that really focused on um, capturing sort of everyday aspects of Black and Indigenous social life um, in the region. And at the time, I didn't really think of myself as an artist. Um, and I was really sort of invested in thinking about my, you know, sort of my primary identity as an anthropologist and as a scholar. But even in that moment, I had already found myself really um, exhausted by my attempts, you know, as Michelle Cliff writes, to kind of push against the granite wall of Western, sort of liberal Western epistemology. And, you know, and I could, I could see all the ways that a desire to sort of know and inhabit the world in a different way, to sort of know the world otherwise, really um, was apparent in the in the sort of ways that I began to try to um, document the region um, and Black women's lives in the region um, through my visual practice. And I have to admit that I haven't looked at these photos in many years. <laughs> it's been about 10 years since I've looked at these photographs. And so, you know, the, the invitation to this conversation is really what prompted me to begin to revisit them and to reconsider what they might mean in larger aesthetic and political and theoretical terms. But I can see now with the benefit of time and distance, how many of the questions that Beer takes up in her work, um, particularly her thinking about blackness as a spatial formation and her exploration of black women's intimate geographies continues to shape my own creative practice in ways that I'm, I'm sort of only really beginning to, to make sense of. 
And so what I want to do is just kind of show a few of the photographs that um, that I have been revisiting um, and sort of thinking about their the ways that they articulate with my kind of larger body of work. And you know, as I said earlier, I, I didn't add all the photographs of other things that I've been doing, but you know, a lot of my visual practice really focuses on understanding sort of the context of blackness in specific social landscapes and kind of geopolitical contexts. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing um, over the last seven years has really focused on tracing my family's migrations throughout the United States and the Caribbean, looking at their encounters with specific industries, particularly the sugar industry in South Florida and the petrochemical industry of Southern Louisiana, and kind of thinking about how to create my own sort of um, archive of Black social life in these landscapes where, where the attempts to erase the presence of Black people <laughs> Um, in both physical and kind of discursive terms um, is unfolding with kind of frightening speed um, and violence. And these are things that, you know, at the time when I began doing this work, I hadn't really thought about the ways that my experiences in Nicaragua and engaging with the work of, of June Beer really um, animated my approach to thinking about the relationship between place and Blackness. And so, you know, these are some of the photographs that I took while I was there, this is a photograph of the Bluefields Bay, which I could see from my house, um, and which is a kind of geography that centers very, you know, that's that's a kind of central location and a lot of kind of rep visual representations of the region. Um, this is another image here, I, and part of why I like these images is that they remind me a lot of the kind of um, 19th century and early 20th century postcards that you would see coming out of Central America that would, you know, circulate uh, globally. That kind of that people would send a lot of um, black labor migrants, you would find these in their collections of things that they were sending to people in different parts of the world. And so I kind of wanted to try to recreate that sense of, of like the postcard. And so this is a piece called Deshi. There are other, these other sort of representations of, you know, kind of everyday black social life. So looking at, you know, representations of like kinship and family and scenes of domesticity, like, interior spaces. Um, a lot of June's work um, grapples with those kinds of questions and I wanted to sort of think about how um, intimate spaces can be sites for the performance of ephemeral forms, ephemeral types of freedom. Um, and so, you know, it's been a really interesting exercise to think about how these images also speak to the ways in which, you know, we might examine the relationship of the body to public space um, the relationship of the Black body to the natural and built environment and how the body also functions as a site of memory. Um, this is another photos that, photos that I took of um, called Comparsa, that's uh, about Black dance troops performing in the city. This photograph is Abandonada, um, which in a lot of ways also for me spoke to kind of larger questions around regional and like political neglect of the region um, and the ways that the state is both present and absent in sort of everyday coast life. It's an alley. Again, in a lot of these pieces there, you know, some of my, I wasn't able to find um, all of, you know, all of the paintings that June um, completed and there to date has never been a kind of, um, full catalog of her work completed, um, which I think is actually um, a problem. And it seems like there are folks who are working on it. But one of the things that, you know, one of, a, one of the kind of recurring themes in her work is how she will cite Black women within domestic spaces. And so um, placing Black women in um, kind of traditional, what are called traditional board houses built out of wood, built on a kind of modeled after kind of Caribbean style forms of architecture. and you know, often women will be represented nude in these spaces. And so there's also something I, I always found really moving about the way that she sort of centered her gaze on sort of intimate spaces of Black life um, and how Black women um, articulate their own sort of forms of desire and pleasure um, within these everyday kind of quotidian spaces. And here's another one. This was another kind of interior scene that, um, you know, that is reminiscent of, of Beer's work. And these are a series of self-portraits that I shot um, on a beach in Sandy Bay. And, you know, again, just sort of thinking about 
how to sort of rethink the black female body. And, um, you know, it's been in the context of sort of Nicaraguan representations of blackness and sort of black femininity, there is a tendency to kind of conflate the black female body with the landscape of the Atlantic coast. And I wanted to sort of think about how to trouble that connection or how to think about ways to articulate connections to land that don't sort of reify um, existing sort of forms of racial discourse that do violence to the black female body, but that, that you know, sort of center black women as um, keepers of knowledge about place um, in ways that I think are really important. So I'm going to stop there um, and uh, pass it over back to Celia. But thank you again for the invitation. And I look forward to discussing more of this project as it evolves um, with everyone. Thank you. So oh, great. Thank you so much, Courtney, for sharing your work about engaging with counter archives, but also constituting your own. That's uh, great. I will introduce like our third panelist. Um, so next we will be listening um, to Gina Athena Ulis, a Haitian American artist, anthropologist, and professor of feminist uh, studies at UC Santa Cruz. Her research questions engage uh, geopolitics, historical representations, materiality, and aesthetics in the dailiness of black diasporic conditions to confront the visceral and in the structural. Her work and artistic practice are rooted in what she calls rassemblage, a gathering of people, things, ideas, and spirits, not necessarily in that order. She is the author of several uh, books and articles, including Why Haiti Needs New Narratives, a post quid chronicle, and Because When God is Too Busy, uh, Haiti, Me and the World, a collection of photographs, poetry, and performing texts. Gina, thank you so much for being with us. Um, and yes, we're listening to you. Ready Starts with Here the I things go. laid. You can't hide. But the historicity of the human Gonna condition always requires that practices of power and domination be renewed. The world recreated humankind is master of a new fate, strengthened by a new experience of life. The fruitfulness of this admirable doctrine that it poses to each of us, the immediate problems from which it is impossible to shy away without cowardice. It is now vital to dare to know oneself, to dare to confess to oneself what one is, to dare to ask oneself what one wants to be. Without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. We not only end up confused, rudderless, and cynical, but we forget that making a revolution is not a series of clever maneuvers and tactics, but a process that can and must transform us. If your house ain't in order, you ain't in order. Revolution begins with the self, in the self. I exist as I am, and that is enough. I exist as I am, and that is enough. I exist as I am, and that is enough. Because we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Ready or not, here I come, you can't hide. Gonna find you and take it slowly. Ready or not, 
here I come, you can't hide. Gonna find you and take it slowly. Magua. Maria. Saragua. Maguana. Igwe. A shipload of items traded in exchange for 500 enslaved Africans. Kari's 20,000 pounds. Coarse German linen, 1,500 pieces. Cotton lens 30 yards white, 100 pieces. Cotton lens 30 yards blue, 50 pieces. Cotton lens 15 yards white, 250 pieces. Cotton lens calico with large flowers, 150 pieces. Cotton lens striped, 130 pieces. Firearms, 200. Copper or brass basins from three pounds to eight pounds, 600 pounds. Gunpowder for small arms, 1,000 pounds. Iron bars, 1,006 pounds. Coral, 50. Dutch pipe, best stores, five boxes, 50. Beads and glass toys of different colors. This is a list of a shipload of items traded in exchange for 500 enslaved Africans. Neither blood nor belonging accounted for our presence. I closed my eyes and strained to hear the groans and cries that once echoed in the dungeon, but this space was mute. I am reminded that 12 million crossed the Atlantic Ocean and the past is not yet over. I am the progeny of captives. I am the vestige of the dead. I am the vestige of the dead. I am the vestige of the dead. And history is how the secular world attends to the dead. Not only humans made the crossing. Traveling in one direction through ocean, given the name Atlantic, grief traveled as well. Grief traveled as well. Grief traveled as well. The dead do not like to be forgotten. The dead do not like to be forgotten. The dead do not like to be forgotten, especially those whose lives had come to a violent end and had been stacked in high in a sea of mass graves. Egg Aguila Negra from France. Voyage began July 16, 1702, 500 boarded, 107 survived. Marie-Françoise, France. Voyage began May 19, 1726, 400 boarded, 80 survived. Saint-Jacques, France. Voyage began October 2nd, 1741, 239 boarded, 162 survived. Aigre, France, voyage began July 12th, 1786, 391 boarded, 260 survived. Do you get any bogus of your family? Have you ever wondered why it is all we seem to have learned from you? It's how to corrupt our societies and how to be tyrants. You will have to accept that it is mostly your fault. 
Let me show you how you look to us. You came. You took things that were not yours. You took things that were not yours. You took things that were not yours. And you did not even, for appearance's sake, ask for us. You could have said, may I have this, please? And even though it would have been clear to everybody that a yes or no from us would have been of no consequence, you might have looked so much better. Believe me, it would have gone a long way. I would have had to admit that at least you were polite. Do you get any more that serve you for your family? When reality does not coincide with deeply held beliefs, human beings tend to phrase interpretations that force reality within the scope of these beliefs. They devise formulas to repress the unthinkable and to bring it back within the realm of accepted discourse. Undoubtedly, there comes a specific moment when political events occur as if by destiny, regardless of our wishes. The human spirit progresses and often inspires some inner process which ultimately shakes nations and leads them to unavoidable commotions from which emerges a new era with institutions that are better suited to the times. But these events, are the results of specific forces. They are produced by specific factors. We cannot neglect the least of these factors if we are to understand these events. Every owner of slaves shall, whenever possible, ensure that his slaves belong to as many ethno-linguistic groups as possible. If they cannot speak to each other, they cannot foment rebellion and revolution. Kill them off. Kill them off, kill them off, and get new ones who know nothing of liberty and equality. There is no movement among our Negroes. There is no movement among our Negroes. They are very tranquil and obedient. A revolt among them is impossible. Oh, we have nothing to fear on the part of the Negroes. We sleep with our doors and windows wide open. Freedom for Negroes is a chimera. Well, there was only two methods of subverting a colonial system so long and deeply rooted in time and prejudice. The one, gradual, emanated from our oppressors themselves. The other, sudden and violent, originated with the oppressed and was contrary to the wishes of our tyrants. We used the last method. We used the last method. We used the last method. Indeed, it is not enough to be free of whips, principalities, and powers. You pay me off, you savages. Build me an equitable human assertion. Build me an equitable human assertion. Build me an equitable human assertion. One that looks like a jungle. Or one that looks like the cities of the West. But I, 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 I provide the stock, the beast, the myths. Do you get any bogus stuff if by your family? Some things go on. Some things just stay. I used to think it was just my memory. Some things you forget, other things you never do. Some things you forget, other things you never do. None of us starts with a clean slate. None of us start with a clean slate, none of us. But the historicity of the human condition also requires that practices of power and domination be renewed. If your house ain't in order, you ain't in order. 
the world, recreated humankind is master of a new phase, threatened by a new experience of life. The fruitfulness of this admirable doctrine that it poses to each of us, the immediate problem from which it is impossible to shy away with our cowardice, it is now vital to dare to know oneself, to dare to confess to oneself what one is, to dare to ask oneself what one wants to be. Without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. We not only end up confused, rudderless and cynical, but we forget that making a revolution is not a series of clever maneuvers and tactics, but a process that can and must transform us. Revolution begins with the self in the self. Revolution begins with the self in the self. For this space between power and vulnerability is not just an edge. There is room there. There is room there. There is room there. There is room for deference. There is room for humility. There is room for surrender. And there is room for grace. Thank you. So um, I just want to tell you very quickly that the first piece is from a sound installation in Equitable Human Assertion that was at the Biennale of Sydney in 2020, this massive thing that I was invited to create. Um, and part of the sound, part of the script is what I read today is from a project called Black Liberation Mashup. And I think people who are um, lit people would have identified a number of the quotations that you heard. Um, so I'm in conversation here with, I'm just gonna read them off very quickly. So D.R. Hartman, M. Jackie Alexander, Jamaica Kincaid, Michelle Wolf Cuyo, Antonio Filmin, um, Norby C. Phillips, C.L.R. James, Baron Duveste, uh, Kamal Brathwaite, Amiri Baraka, Tony Morrison, Suzanne uh, Césaire, of course, and Tony Kate Bambara, Robin D.G. Kelly, as well as um, Lisa Bailey. And it's part of an ongoing project, just thinking through um, and working with works that have been done by artists, thinkers, activists, um, academics, and who are just at the forefront, have been at the forefront of this question of black liberation. And for me, it was really important to, as a Haitian American feminist artist, um, to move Haiti away from the narrative of exceptionalism and show that it's more connected to the rest of the black world and vice versa. So that, that's my point here is that Haiti's been at the avant-garde and that's where I'm going to take us into conversation. And thank you so much, Honor, and everyone for the invitation. And I look forward to engaging with everybody. Thank you so much, Gina. Ayi Bobo. Ayi Bobo. All right. Um, I will now introduce Tamara Toledo, who will kind of like lead us and like, I would say sitting with all of that work and like a uh, um, question. So Tamara Toledo is a Chilean born Toronto based scholar, curator and artist, a graduate of uh, the Ontario College of Art and Design University. And she holds an F F M F A. sorry about that, from York University and is a PhD art history and visual culture candidate at York University. So Toledo is co-founder of the Allende Arts Festival and of Latin American Canadian Arts Project. And for over a decade, she has curated numerous exhibitions offering spaces and opportunities to artists of Latin American descent to showcase their work. She designed and has been curating the Latin American Speakers Series for which she has invited internationally renowned contemporary, contemporary artists and curators to Toronto. Her practice often follows an interdisciplinary approach and touches on notions of memory, identity, diasporas, transnationalism, issues of power, representation, and international artistic cultural interaction. Toledo is presently the director curator of Surca uh, Gallery, 
the only space dedicated to contemporary Latin American art in Canada. We're listening to you, Donna. Thank, thank, you thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much, Celia and uh, Courtney, Roshini, uh, Gina. Uh, that was incredible work. Um, although I wasn't uh, familiar with your work prior to today, I, I kind of uh, uh, looks through your websites, but it's a truly inspiring um, and resonates with, with what I'm interested, particularly uh, with this idea of transformation. Um, and I thought that uh, perhaps what I could do is, um, is share some of what I'm uh, particularly interested in, what my work has been um, about, and uh, share some images with you. Um, just to give me a second to figure out how to do this. PowerPoint. Go. Um, yeah, and and so I think that um, the this sort of um, the uh, theme of the, of the forum really resonated with me, and I think that uh, perhaps I was invited as a discussant to touch on notions of how I see myself as an uh, instigator of, of change and, and also um, how, I, how I view my work as a curator, as a scholar, and, and this, these ideas of unsilencing the unthinkable, uh, but also as, a, as part of the Chilean diaspora. So that's where I kind of wanted to start today. And um, and when when I was uh, told about the uh, um, and, uh, the first memory that came to to my mind was um, when I read the description was the fact that I've been told so many times to my face that uh, this intention to open a space interested in our art or enough artists of Latin American descent to, to occupy such a space in Canada. Uh, not, not only was it a dream, but it was also unthinkable. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, again, talk to you a little bit about uh, sort of what my history is and, and how I can, can relate to, to the questions that have been uh, touched on today. So I'm a refugee from Chile, a curator, a visual artist, and a scholar, and I have been curating exhibitions and projects for the past 15 years in Canada. Um, as mentioned, I'm a co-founder of a nonprofit arts organization, La Cap, and of Sur Gallery, um, which is the only space in, in all of Canada that is dedicated to Latin American and Latinx art. I decided to return to academia after many years of working within the arts industry because I felt the pressing need to address the lack of representation of Latinx and Latin American art. And to a certain extent, I've been able to fulfill this urgency through my curatorial and advocacy work. But I have found that within the parameters of uh, Eurocentric and Western canons, it is almost impossible to be recognized, heard, or even acknowledged and uh, the thought um, that I and I thought that the best way would be to insert myself in academia, write and archive and position our stories with the validation it's deserved. There's very little discussion, theoretical observation, research analysis, and scholarly interest in the Latinx diaspora and its art in Canada. Therefore, my intentions um, are to produce scholarship that acknowledges this underrepresented diaspora and add their voices to a Canadian art history that up until now has been predominantly a white settler narrative. Uh, and so this theme of unsilencing the unthinkable interrelates with um, the work I'm engaged with and believe in, where I attempt to find connections and points of solidarity um, 
the relationship that I have with place of origin and the struggles that I have faced throughout my life really determine how I view the world and uh, how I relate these struggles to the land I inhabit today, to the anti-oppressive stance I am committed to and to the anti-colonial perspective of, of an unthinkable task such as of creating this uh, uh, equal representation within the Canadian context. And so since the 1970s, when a wave of Latin American refugees arrived in Canada, escaping military oppression, Latin American artists and political activists explored the way art could affect social change and serve as a platform for civic engagement. Neocolonialism, imperialism, and neoliberalism, with their systemic forms of oppression and exclusion, have been a source of struggle for decades within the global south, and its diaspora has suffered its effects. The struggles of decolonization and anti-colonial perspectives is nothing new to Latin America and its diaspora. And since childhood, I've been formed and nourished by anti-imperialist and solidarity ideologies and was formed as a politicized entity with a vision to contribute collectively to the betterment of society. My professional career is intrinsically linked to those aspirations and ideologies, and I have followed a path of advocacy within my work with the curatorial projects and scholarship that I engage with. Today in Canada, we face neoliberal and often racist agendas, yet many artists take their stance with new proposals of contestation, emancipation and reclamation, with the Black Lives Matter movement and with an indigenous sovereignty struggles that demand reckoning before reconciliation. These social and artistic movements react to centuries of injustices and genocide. And the Latin American diaspora contributes with its own forms of proposals of contestation, forming alliances and modes of solidarity. A long history and a strong legacy of struggle is found within diasporas and with indig indigenous peoples throughout the Americas. And it is there where we can find spaces of reclamation and identification to support our struggle for a better future. I stand on the shoulders of those who have fought before us, for without their work and resiliency, I, like so many other immigrants and refugees, would face a much harder path. They paved the way for us to confront different challenges and mark our own spaces of resiliency. Their legacy demonstrates that a multicultural, diverse, and inclusive Canada is a myth, for opportunities and benefits are left for a white privileged sector of Canada's population. One cannot pretend that one lives in a place of inclusivity when Latin American diasporic or other marginal stories are not shared, learned, recorded, theorized, or archived. Colonialism as well as coloniality have hindered possibilities of representation and empowerment, and I have witnessed firsthand its impediments. Canada has benefited of an international reputation for welcoming and offering opportunities to immigrants and refugees, promoting multicultural haven to the world. Yet it's important to acknowledge that this reputation is guided by economic interests to capitalize on the labor of immigrants and has not been as welcoming to many diaspora. What I would like to emphasize is this contradiction for Canada's exclusionary system disempowers, erases and neglects. But despite this multicultural erasure an activist Latin American and Latinx artistic community has shared their stories of fear, trauma and violence with their immediate communities, within grassroots and cultural settings, excluded from canonical narratives. This diasporic community of artists have created insular sites of existence and creativity and have offered voices of resistance to an inattentive art circulation. Very few have been granted with the deserving recognition and scholarship within museum and academia of Latin American and Latinx artistic practices is non-existent in Canada. Latin American and Latinx artists have had the resiliency to continue a path of artistic development worthy of our attention, and I believe there is a space to critically examine its contributions and identify value in their work. This diaspora has articulated themes of polarization, displacement, and precariousness. They have studied notions of rupture and crisis in their work, representing manifestations of economic exploitation and inequality, all of which are tied to experiences of loss and trauma. Their work and subjects resonate with our, with our current times of global uncertainty, anxiety, and upheaval, 
and their objections to neoliberal and colonial systems of power have infiltrated today's contemporary mainstream Canadian art tendencies. These issues are nothing new to this diaspora large community, which shares a history of war, violence, and struggle. Communities fleeing economic precarity and or political persecution have found within Canada classist and racist systems that have imposed a st status of second-class citizens. They have been disempowered for lack of resources, economic precariousness, labor inequalities, language barriers, and systems of knowledge. Not all have had this fate for language, race, gender, class, and education determine the future of many diasporic communities, often serving as token or as or are detrimental to the development of their artistic practices. Many artists of the diaspora have contributed with the development of decolonization proposals and have offered an aesthetic of contestation, raising awareness of social and political struggles, carving spaces of representation, despite being pass, cast as subaltern or as token subjects. Despite there being a notably progressive recent interest in BIPOC practices, I question the construction of critical discourses that negotiate inclusivity within hegemonic centers. I'm not only interested in the diversification and inclusion of non-hegemonic artistic approaches, but with the, within the relations that follow, the intentions that persist, and the opportunities for growth for those who have been silenced and erased for so long. I believe that the question, that as I question concepts of the unthinkable, my place of origin is of relevance. I seek guidance from my ancestors. I look for inspiration from those who lost their lives fighting for human rights. And I claim belonging to a generation who has learned to make Canada a place of home. With the due respect and acknowledgement its original inhabitants deserve. As the daughter of Chilean refugees who came to Canada fleeing political persecution, the political climate right now in Chile is not only of relevance but can serve as an example to the rest of the world. My family was granted asylum in Canada in 74 after a brutal dictatorship overthrew Allende's government, aided by the U.S. in 73. My family returned to Chile 10 years later, and we lived under a dictatorship that imposed not only a political agenda of fear and persecution, but an economic model, neoliberalism. Exchanges between the U.S. and the Pinochet regime favored free markets, incentivized the economy through increased monetary circulation, and limited the role government played in economic and policy matters. The promotion and consumerism and the privatization of natural resources to privately owned national and foreign corporations was facilitated by a regime that dismantled social and political platforms. Pinochet's dictatorship was used as a testing ground for a neoliberal economic model for the rest of the world. And in the process, thousands of Chileans were murdered, tortured, disappeared, imprisoned, and exiled. After the return to democ democracy in 1990, a series of elected coalition presidents were no match to the neoliberal phenomenon that would override again this vision for a socialist country. And on October 18, 2019, marginalized groups throughout Chile took over the streets to demand change. Students, indigenous peoples, seniors, women, and immigrants had nothing more to lose after three decades of democratic administrations and neoliberal economic policies impoverished its population. The massive daily protests ended five months later due to the world pandemic. And during this time, we witnessed a resurgence of public art interventions and manifestations. And the role art played in shaping this Chilean political process is is undeniable with artists activating with murals, logos, designs, chants, public installations, and interventions. Las Tesis is a perfect example of this, a collective of feminist artists who used performance in public space to denounce patriarchal systems that protected gender-based violence. Un violador en tu camino, a rapist in your path, created an international wave Within days, then women across the globe adopted the chant and the choreography to their own struggles. The collective 
reference the current political state blindfolded during each performance artists reference the people who lost their vision during the social unrest police enforcement targeted protesters with rubber bullets directed to their faces causing many to lose their eyesight tens of thousands of women gathered on december 4th 2019 two months after it had become viral worldwide. This time, the performance was held in front of the National Stadium, a symbolic gesture in front of the dictatorship's concentration camp. Women chanted, squatted, and danced, their fists in the air, the power and viscerally unequivocal potency of art sparked people's imaginations and changed perspectives of both older and younger generations of feminists. Since then, an unthinkable outburst of months of social unrest has led to an unimaginable outcome of creative and innovative thinking, changing Chile's political and social landscape. One of the demands of the social uprising was to dismantle Pinochet's constitution of 1980, which ensured the dictator would remain in power. Forty years later, this massive wave of unrest led to the unthinkable for neither democratic presidencies prior had been able to change the dictatorial constitution. Most recently, the youngest elected president will take power in March of 2022. 35-year-old left-wing Gabriel Boric has promised a challenging platform, one that will inevitably be difficult to achieve, but that has given hope to a country longing for change. We will see what is yet to come. But for now, I believe that is when, within art that we can find spaces of relief and alternative proposals of contestation to the turbulent past, our current state of uncertainty, and the future that is yet to come. This in-between space that I navigate as a member of a diaspora with a family history of political activism and of uprooting allows for me to find purpose in the work that I do. It offers connections with different points of intersection and within different contexts. That is why when I refer to the unthinkable for someone such as myself, who has struggled with displacement, with discrimination, fear, and with trauma, art is not only an aesthetic choice, but becomes a vehicle that links both worlds, two stories and common struggles. It becomes a tool that facilitates a conversation and establishes common grounds with other diasporas to navigate our existence where we are silenced and erased. And I think that is where this common thread lies, where art becomes a space of solidarity and of, of an acknowledgement. And that is my presentation. I will stop sharing. And I think that um, I really wanted to give you a, a bit of a sense of where I was coming from before um, making links, because I think there is a lot of common um, struggles, um, a lot of points where, you know, a lot of um, points that we all touch in certain, in a certain degree. Um, in different ways, through photography, through installation, um, through curatorial practice, but that in essence, we are all speaking the same language, which is trying to communicate this um, idea that they're, you know, despite all the, the silenced and underrepresentation and erasure um, as artists, you have the ability to change that. And, and I think that where is where the power lies. Um, I don't know, Celia, if you would like to, to say anything. Well, I will start by thanking you <laughs> and uh, thanking all of you for sharing like your work, your stories, your voices, uh, very inspiring like presentation, I think. Um, I know we're not working with a lot of time, but I hope we'll be able to take a couple of questions. I will wait to, I will look for a sign coming from Sir Lack from uh, Honor if you're back. 
Um, and yeah, in the meantime, I know that like people are actually writing questions in our um, Q and A. Um, so before I get that signed, maybe I can share some of the questions with you. Uh, but uh, thank you again. Um, so the first um, question comes from Catalina Vargas. Um, what can be done from the community to help elevate Latin um, uh, artists? Um, I think that's for it. I guess mm -hmm. that's for me. Um, yeah. How do we elevate uh, Latin Latinx artists? I think, I mean, this is this is my my question, and this is has been my my uh, work for so long for over fifteen years, um, and I think it's been a different throughout. Um, it's changed throughout the years. Uh, different kind of needs, different um, um, time frames. At the beginning of my career, um, the need to have platforms was important. Um, there was nowhere to exhibit work. Uh, none of the galleries um, and much less bigger institutions were interested in, in artists of the diaspora. Um, and even internationally renowned Latin American artists weren't exhibited in, in big institutions. So um, things have changed since then. Um, and I think for me, returning to academia um, at this stage in my career is, is mainly because I, I see the lack in, in scholarship. Um, and that's sort of what I touched on at the beginning. There's very little written about uh, the diaspora of, of the Latin American uh, diaspora. So if you are a scholar, um, I would urge you to to do that. Um, if you're in, in the context of Canada, I'm not sure where you're, where you're speaking from, but. Um... Excellent, thank you. Um, I will um, just like uh, give people more time to phrase some questions, but some of like, you know, the, I would say the, the of, of the, the things that are written in the Q&A are more like comments than actual questions. So I really encourage like our participants to uh, grab like the, the opportunity to ask questions about the work that our panelists are presenting or have presented. Um, yeah. So it will take a couple of minutes or seconds, seconds, let's say. I think that like we have, we can, I've been told that we can take like around 10 minutes for questions, which is not a lot. <laughs> Well, I wonder if in the meantime, uh, <laughs> while we're waiting for things to percolate, we could maybe have a conversation amongst ourselves, right? That would be awesome. That was what I was about to suggest. I'm sure okay. that, like, you probably have comments and questions, so please feel free to, to share them. Well, I'm interested. <laughs> I'm interested in the fact that we're representing all these different points in the diaspora. Yet, you know, we have, you know, what we have in common is the fact that we're artist scholars of one kind or another. So, my, what I would like to, you know, the question I'd like to pose is what it means to navigate these two worlds, right? That, you know, there's information circulating in the academy that's not necessarily in the art world, yet we are a product of both. And what does it mean to do work knowing that? Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that question, Gina. Um, I feel like, you know, there's sort of maybe two ways of thinking about it. I mean, I think what was so great about your piece and just the way that you kind of called all of these different thinkers into the room through this sort of, you know, kind of repetitive, you know, this sort of practice of, um, 
repetition, you know, that it was just so powerful. And I, it made me think about how I see a similar kind of conversation, I think, unfolding between Black feminist thinkers and Black artists. Like, it's been really interesting, for example, looking at the work of someone like Alexis Pauline Gums, who's writing entire books around the work of people like Jackie Alexander or Hortense Spillers. And I, I really sort of felt you doing a similar thing, but also so deeply rooted in your in your sort of spiritual and ancestral traditions as a you know a Haitian American artist. And so I think like in that way, it's actually really productive to straddle both of these worlds and, and very generative. But I, I think one of the challenges is trying to think about how to navigate that practice institutionally and what it means to be um, you know, black and brown uh, artists who are sometimes speaking in registers that really remain illegible to the institution um, in a variety of ways. And it's like, no matter how many ways you try to translate it, <laughs> it's still, there's still a way in which the things that, the sort of critiques that I think we're making in our work and the, and the modalities through which we make those critiques um, are still uh, unrecognized, underappreciated and undervalued. So it sort of requires, I think, a pivot from thinking about the academy as one's primary audience and sort of reorienting and thinking about how one might engage different kind of publics who are more conversant in the ways that we talk about um, our work and, and do our work. So thank you for that question. I'll just add, add to that. Thanks very much for the question. I mean, I, would, I, I don't know about you, but I think post-COVID or post you know, kind of pandemic, you know, I, I have a, an incredible, and it could be to do with being across the water, but I have an incredible cynicism of the institutions. And that's whether that's the art institution <laughs> or the academic institution. And that's because I don't think they're fit for purpose for us, right? And I also don't think that they are in any way particularly, certainly um, in the UK, there's a level of a, a more conservative and, le and more risk, uh, a more conservative and more kind of reactive kind of mode of behavior that isn't taking into consideration what we now need to do, right? So, so for me that, you know, the idea of really um, bringing into question at all times, the the kind of limitations we're finding ourselves um, to the of of either any institution, whether that's academia or in the arts institution, um, is really something that I think um, has really ha happened and been accelerated through COVID. So the question for me and the excitement for me is also, I mean, Tamara showed uh, some examples of thinking about how artistic practice of course is converging with brilliant thinking uh, you know it's, it's a, a kind of interdisciplinary space now that we're operating from but we also are uh, you know I think art making is also occurring in substantially different spaces because of those limitations of those institutions mm -hmm. so for me I'm thinking about autonomy and the unthinkable <laughs> as being, you know, the kind of thinking outside of the box of the institutions that are constraining us, right? And, and that is absolutely the art institution. We are now making, the art market is making work for uh, private funders, you know, for equity people, right? We're not, we're, you know, and so capitalism in that sense, you know, become, comes under question as well and how it functions and how it supports levels of racism um, and this precise kind of um, uh, divisive mechanism um, in, in a way of, of uh, how we might speak to each other, how we might move forward in a more collaborative way. So I'm, I'm very interested in always stepping outside the box, always questioning the institution that we sit within. We all have to sit in the institutions in order to function, but that doesn't mean that we have to accept them for what they are. And part of the decolonial process is precisely that, is absolutely about, which we all are doing, I think, in a way. So thank you for that question. And I just think there's, you know, we have that moment, I always start 
uh, with my students are talking about, well, how do we think about change at this point? We changed pre-COVID, we changed during COVID, everything got disrupted. The ability to think in a much more progressive way is right now. Um, and we have to keep that momentum going, it seems to me. But I'll keep quiet, I'm just kind of, you know, going on a bit, but yeah. Thank you. Do does anyone else like on the panel want to share um, a comment? I mean, I can I can just echo what Courtney and Roshini said. I think that um, definitely things have changed after the pandemic of how we view um, and work and engage with each other. Um, and I think now is the time to really rethink uh, uh, about how we move forward, how we make new proposals, um, how we view the institution, how we change the institution. Um, and, and I think that's that's sort of why I introduced this, this um, example of Chile, not only because I am from there and, and I'm uh, rooted there and um, uh, my, my place of origin is from there and, and all my um, systems of belief and knowledge come from that experience. Um, but also because there, um, that change is happening and it is actually happening. Um, something that can be completely unimaginable um, in a place like Canada. Uh, they're rethinking of how to uh, pluriversalize uh, a constitution, how to, how to change uh, uh, from the root up um, things of the society completely. Um, and, and I think that's where we can find inspiration and that's where we can find um, sort of how we can move forward um, and, and reconceptualize ideas of, of, of this idea of transformation, uh, ideas of decolonization. Thanks a lot. And I think that somehow you kind of like already started answering one of the questions um, we have and the Q&A. So I will probably like just like open it up to the other panelists. Like maybe, Gina, you might want to give us your opinion. One of the questions like that each of these presentations uh, work in different ways to connect art, activism, solidarity and social transformation. Um, and so that person is asking how the pandemic has impacted your work and your practice. Um, and also how art might help us to rethink activism and resistance um, in the context of the pandemic. Well, I, um, I, I kind of, I, uh, I, I went underground if, um, because it was something of a shock that I was in Australia and literally had to run home um, in the middle of, at the beginning of a Biennale and had to like get home before lockdown. I mean, that was just like, and then I moved to California and then there were fires and I had to evacuate. Um, and so for me, and I appreciate a lot what Roshini said about the changes before COVID, the changes during COVID and the changes that are right now. I mean, we are, we are in the midst of transformation, right? Um, so for, um, it hit me initially as a shock, all of it. And my system just really was like, wow, what just happened? Um, but I have this thing that I say, I said, California is like Haiti with a lot of money, <laughs> you know, and some structure, right? Because all the extremities are here. They're all here. You know, I'm in one of the wealthiest little enclaves, but it's also one of the poorest enclaves because a lot of people have housing insecurity, food insecurity. So you see just the gamut. It's also strikingly beautiful, gorgeous between the Pacific and the Redwoods, but then you've got all these fires, you've got all these environmental um, challenges. So 
it it was it the 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 that chaos became an invitation out of survival actually i had to kind of slow down um and i wasn't going that fast to begin with and what it did is just asked me I, I, I like to talk about this sort of method or methodology of surrender. I surrendered to what was happening because I was like, I'm not going to become a casualty of capitalism. <laughs> I mean, it's out to take you out, right? You know, it is, it's, I mean, that's what it feels like. And then I had to just stop and, you know, I refused to perform online because again, there's this way for me where Zoom University, you know, it's like people don't consider half an hour between meetings anymore because you're 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 available and you could everything can be back to back. And then so it's like, well, what's happening to my body? What's happening to my system? What's happening to my breathing? And if I'm not aware of that, then how do I show up um, as an educator, as a human being? How do I show up? in the world. Um, so my work has is now so much about nature because the, my only part of my solace was the woods um, and, 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 and the relationship to land, like land-based. And, and, and there's a way that I think that oftentimes um, that relationship is, is wrongly characterized as very Eurocentric because of who the naturalists and um, have been taught to be. When in reality, you have both a history of indigenous presence, you know, that preceded um, this sort of violent colonial uh, encounter. And then whether you're talking about Afro diasporic based um, religious practices, the connection to the land was always there. Um, and, and so for me, I think one of the most beautiful thing that has happened is it is that is that and now I'm trying to you know I'm working with what's in front of me and then figuring out what does that mean um um yeah yeah it's it, it it changed a lot I think it made me a calmer person I think it made me you know I go to my class and we start with the meditation because I'm just like oh we got to breathe deep these days <laughs> so, gosh, <that's> so, <laughs> slow it down <laughs> Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gina. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, we don't have a lot of time left, but like there's so like a lot of important questions. So I'm gonna ask Courtney, like if you have thoughts to share about like maybe like the impact that, that the pandemic had on your um, work and, and practice, but also I'll share one of the questions that is on the Q&A. Um, and that person is asking if you can give an account of the relationship between Bluefields, mm -hmm. Nicaragua and Jamaica. Um, that's like, <laughs> not an easy one. Yeah. But yeah, uh, but in terms of, yeah, I'll just l let you deal with the questions the way you want to. Well, I mean, I'm certainly able to explain the relationship historically between Bluefields and Jamaica. Uh, whether that's possible within the, the scope of time we have left, it, that's probably not likely. But yes, there is a very long historical relationship between, um, you know, folks living on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua and Jamaica. I mean, particularly because you know, there was a point where that part of the country was a, a British protectorate. And so they answered the sort of closest governing structure was located in Kingston. So they were, you know, there were like longstanding diplomatic ties, cultural ties, commercial ties between, specifically between Jamaica and many people who, you know, currently are um, considered Creole in Nicaragua are people who came to that part of the world by way of Jamaica through processes of labor migration over you know many many decades um, from world centuries really from the 17th century through the 19th and, the, and well into the early 20th century so those relationships are are you know long standing and continue to sort of animate political sort of social memory and people's ideas around their own sense of, of cultural identity and ongoing ties cultural and otherwise to um, to the Caribbean but you know in terms of thinking about how the pandemic has affected my practice. I mean, you know, I think for many of us, it was a, this has been a moment where we have had to really kind of turn um, and to think and to sort of work from these sort of more um, everyday intimate spaces, right? And, and for me, you know, so much of my creative practice is about being in place. Like when I'm making work about my family's migrations from Jamaica to South Florida, 
And I want to talk about their relationship to sugar. <laughs> I need to be in the cane fields when I want to talk about the impact of the oil industry on my mother's family and how the sort of the legacy of Jim Crow lives on in the body um, in particular kinds of ways. I, I, I go to those places. I think, you know, one of the things I was thinking, and so listening to Roshini talk about her work and thinking about sort of what it means to kind of make art in the Anthropocene from a kind of Caribbean perspective um, and from the perspective of, of women cultural workers who are grappling, who are really living on the front lines of the climate disaster that, you know, that we are, that is unfolding in a sort of, slow, it's a sort of slow unfolding, um, you know, and then also thinking about the way that, you know, Gina is sort of thinking about like the sort of egum practices and like the, the, the kind of ancestor veneration work that's happening and the sort of reclamation of these um, ancestral spiritual traditions, you know, it, it feels like this is a moment where time feels really strange, like time kind of slowed down in this weird way. And so I found myself sort of thinking about what it means to sort of think about the past, the present, and the future to sort of reorient our sort of temporal frames for thinking about the, you know, thinking about the social world um, and how art can be kind of a portal for time travel, you know, and like that's kind of what I've been thinking a lot about. And so my practice has really shifted, I think, to like thinking about what kind of memories live in my own body, how I can kind of tap into that, those forms of knowledge that live in my body. Also, you know, connecting with nature, you know, the spiritual traditions that I'm connected to are all nature-based. So it's been a real kind of opportunity to dive deeply into those practices in a way that I think prior to the pandemic, I was certainly thinking about, but now have kind of taken on a, a, a much more, um, they just feel more resonant. Um, and I feel the power and like the possibility of those practices in a way that I think I hadn't fully appreciated before. So that's kind of where my work is at at the moment. And it's also been a moment to try to, you know, to slow down and try out different kind of genres um, and forms of practice that I think before I hadn't really done. So doing more video work, um, and revisiting previous work that I had done, um, as in the case of the work with Nicaragua, that I, when I took it, I was just like, oh, I don't know what this is. And now I'm like, oh, actually, maybe this is something. And I have time to sit with it. So I'm just trying to make the most of that. Anyway. Thanks a lot. I think that like we're getting to the end of our conversation. Roshini, would you like to share? last like thoughts or ideas with us regarding your practice or like future directions i mean i i was just thinking about the the pandemic and um uh i, I won't say much more but i was just going to i was thinking about the way in which you know as gina said we kind of slow down and we also were for 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 me it was about questioning what uh, what we were doing with our time, right? <laughs> Who we were spending time with, um, how much time we were spending, you know, and the and of course that particularly was in relation to work and making work. Um, so in work in the institutions and making work. So that for me was something. And then and then I think the other thing that really struck me was, you know, um, and I think that was something that I really picked up on when thinking about the place of archive and the place of history and all of our different practices um, was, you know, who who we were listening to. So there was something quite interesting and, and fascinating about the the, the agency that black women activists were having in all of our practice, which of course might you know be very obvious, but I think that there is a very real focus now to really think through the kind of historical trajectory of that of that process in in a in a way that's quite urgent. So for me, it was about that kind of selection process of who I was listening to. These masses of Zoom kind of lectures and talks and explosion of culture that was going on and we were very selective about you know the opportunity to be selective of what we were listening to and what we were hearing and who we wanted to hear really became quite an important uh, aspect for me and then I think the other thing that uh, you know just picking up on on what uh, Courtney and Gina were talking about in relation to this kind of thinking about land and the relationship of a more than human space, if you like. And I was thinking about, you know, a kind of um, a, about my practice. So the reflexive process of the practice in relation to 
it not being extractive, right? So, it, so how do we think about a non-extractive process of being, of making, um, and by extractive, extract, non-extractive, I'm thinking about, you know, we're extracting, as scholars, we extract knowledge from people, right? <laughs> so how do we do that in a way that actually is about respect and is about equity and is about, you know, <laughs> contains all of the kind of values that we want to embed now in a, in a way? And that's a very interesting kind of thing to think about, you know, because ultimately we are still making work from listening and, and, and hearing life experiences around us from other people, right? Uh, do we, how do we do that in a, in a way that's collegiate, that's kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, recognizes and respects people? So for me, that was really something that I, um, I'm taking away and I'm continuing to think about. So thank you for your question. Thank you so much. I think it's probably the perfect way to conclude our conversation because like, you know, it definitely helps us to, yeah, think about art as like a place of solidarity, like counter narrative, counter archive, but also a place of solidarity and relationality. So that's just really perfect. I will um, thank you again for being with us and sharing your work. I don't know that our like format actually allows us to like participants to share reactions, but I'm sure that they would if they could. <laughs> so um, thank you um, again for, for this beautiful and inspiring conversation.